okay, so I guess um, you guys want me to read a book. Um, a lot of people have told me that I have a pretty good voice, so let's give it a shot. So today I'm going to be reading The Improbability Principle, Why Coincidences, Miracles, and Rare Events Happen Every Day by David J. Hand. Um, this is one of my favorite books because it describes how Despite all statistics and probability throughout history, human will has always conquered the odds, somehow in some way, and it's pretty inspirational, and sometimes it explains that even though probability is against us, or it may seem so, things actually aren't. So let's get into it. I'm going to skip everything and go right into chapter one. So chapter one, the mystery, simply unbelievable. In the summer of 1972, the actor Anthony Hopkins was signed to play a leading role in a film based on George Pfeiffer's novel, The Girl from Petrova, so he traveled to London to buy a copy of the book. Unfortunately, none of the main London bookstores had a copy. Then, on his way home, waiting for an underground train at Leicester Square tube station, he saw a discarded book lying on the seat next to him. It was a copy of The Girl from Petrovka, as if that was not coincidence enough, more was to follow. Later, when he had the chance to meet the author, Hopkins told him about the strange occurrence. Pfeiffer was interested. He said that in November 1971, he had lent a copy of the friend. He had lent a friend a copy of the book, a uniquely annotated copy in which he had made notes on turning the British English into American English, such as labor with a U into labor with an O, and so on and so forth, for the publication of the American version. But his friend lost the copy in Bayswater, London. A quick check of the annotations in the copy Hopkins had found showed that it was the very same copy that Pfeiffer's friend had mislaid. You have to ask, what's the chance of that happening? One in a million? One in a billion? Either way, it seems to stretch the bounds of credibility. It hints at an explanation in terms of forces and influence of which we are unaware, bringing the book back in a circle to Hopkins and then to Pfeiffer. Here's another striking incident, this time from the book Synchronicity by the psychoanalyst Carl Jung. He writes, The writer Wilhelm von Schultz tells the story of a mother who took a photograph of her small son in the Black Forest. She left the film to be developed in Strasbourg, but owing to the outbreak of war, she was unable to fetch it and gave it up for loss. In 1916, she bought a film in Frankfurt in order to, off, in order to take a photograph of a daughter who had been born in the meantime. When the film was developed, it was found to be doubly exposed, the picture underneath was the photograph she had taken of her son in 1914. The old film had not been developed and somehow got into circulation again among the new films. Most of us have experienced coincidences rather like these, if not quite so extraordinary. They might be more akin to thinking of someone just before she phones you. Strangely enough, while I was writing part of this book, I had precisely this sort of experience. A colleague at work asked me if I could recommend some publications on the specific aspect of statistical methodology the so-called multivariate t-distribution. The next day I did a little research and managed to identify a book exactly on that topic by two statisticians, Samuel Kotz and Sandalis Nadarja. I had started to type an email to my colleague giving him the details of my book when I was interrupted by a phone call from Canada. During the conversation, the caller happened to mention that Samuel Kotz had just died. And so it goes on. On September 28, 2005, the Telegraph described how a golfer Joan Cresswell scored a hole-in-one with a 50-yard shot on the 13th hole at the Barrow Golf Club at Cumbria in the UK. Surprisingly, you may think, but not outlandishly so. After all, holes-in-one do happen. But what if I tell you that, immediately afterward, a fellow golfer, the novice Margaret Williams, also scored a hole-in-one? There's no getting away from it. Sometimes events occur which seem so improbable, so unexpected, and so unlikely they hint that something about the universe that we don't understand. They make us wonder if the familiar laws of nature and causality through which we run our everyday lives occasionally break down. They certainly make us doubt that they can be explained by the accidental confluence of events, by the random throwing together of people and things. They almost suggest that something is exerting an invisible influence. Often such occurrences merely startle us. They give us stories to tell. On my first trip to New Zealand, I settled down in a cafe and noticed that the notepaper being used by one of two strangers at the neighboring table was from my own university back in the UK. But at other times, these uncanny events can significantly alter lives for the better. 
as such with the New Jersey woman who had won the lottery twice, or for the worse, as with Major Summerford, who was struck by lightning several times. Humans are curious animals, so we naturally seek the underlying cause of strange coincidences. What was it that led two strangers from the same university to travel to the far side of the world and end up sitting at neighboring tables at the same cafe at exactly the same time? What was it that led the woman to pick those two winning sets of lottery numbers? What was it that brought those huge electrostatic forces to hit Major Summerford time and time again? And what steered Anthony Hopkins and the girl from Petrovka through space and through time to the same seat in the same underground station at the same moment? Beyond that, of course, how can we take advantage of the causes underlying such coincidences? How can we, manip how can we manipulate them to our benefit? So far, all of my examples have been very small scale, at the personal level, but there are countless more profound examples. Some seem to imply that not only the human race, but the very galaxies themselves would not have existed if not for some very unlikely events had not occurred. Some relate to how sequences of tiny random changes in our genetic constitution could end up producing something as complicated as a human being. Others relate to the distance of the Earth from the Sun, the existence of Jupiter, and even the values of the fundamental constants of physics. Again, the question arises as to whether blind chance is a realistic explanation for these apparently staggeringly unlikely events, or whether there are, in fact, other influence and forces directing the courses of events behind the scenes. The answers to these questions hinge on what I call the improbability principle. This asserts that extremely improbable events are commonplace. It's a consequence of a collection of mere fundamental laws which all tie together and leave inevitably, inevitably and inexorably to the occurrence of such extraordinarily unlikely events. These laws, this principle, tell us that the universe is in fact constructed so that these coincidences are unavoidable. The extraordinarily unlikely must happen. Events of vanishingly small probability will occur. The improbability principle resolves that the apparent contradiction between the sheer unlikeliness of these events and the fact they nevertheless keep on happening. We'll begin by looking at pre-scientific explanations. These often go far back into the mists of time. Although many people still hold to them, they predate the Baconian Revolution. That is, the idea that the way to understand the natural world is to collect data, conduct experiments, take observations, and use these as test beds through which to evaluate proposed explanations for what's going on. Pre-scientific notions predate the rigorous evaluations of the effectiveness of explanations through scientific methods. But explanations which have not been or cannot be tested have no real force. They are simply anecdotes or stories with the same status as a child's bedtime tale about Santa Claus or the Tooth Fairy. They serve the purpose of reassuring or placating those who are unwilling or unable to make the effort to dig deeper, but they don't lead to understanding. Understanding comes from deeper investigation. In this deeper investigation, thinkers, researchers, philosophers, scientists, have sought to devise laws that describe the way nature works. These laws are shorthand summaries encapsulating in simple form what observation shows about how the universe behaves. They are abstract abstractions. For example, the progress of an object falling from a tall building is described by Newton's second law of motion which says that the acceleration of a body is proportional to the force acting on it. Natural laws seek to get to the heart of phenomena, stripping away the superfluous and crystallizing the essence. The laws are developed by matching predictions with observations, that is, with data. If a law that says increasing the temperature of an enclosed volume of gas will increase its pressure, is this what actually happens? Is this what the data shows? If a law says that increasing the voltage will increase the current, is this what we actually see? We've been extraordinarily successful in d understanding nature by applying this process of data to explanation. The modern world, the accumulation of awesome achievements of humanity's science and technology, is a testament to the powers of such description. Of course, some people seem to think that understanding a phenomena takes away its mystery. That is true in the sense that understanding means removing obscurity, obfuscation, ambiguity, and confusion. But a grasp of the cause of the colors of the rainbow does not detract from its wonder. What such grasp brings is a more, pro more profound appreciation and indeed awe of the beauty underlying the phenomenon being studied. It shows us all how the pieces come together to give an amazing world that we live in. So if you've uh, listened to the end, uh, thank you for listening. And um, I guess 
Uh, I gave you what you wanted. I read a book. Uh, there you go.